This episode is sponsored by Casina. He's considered the most influential architect of all time. With his seminal ideas and over a thousand architectural works, he revolutionized the domestic interior and helped defining the modern home. To Frank Lloyd Wright, furniture was an integral part of his architecture and his pieces have been collected by museums and passionate collectors worldwide for decades. Frank Lloyd Wright is the most important architect of the 20th century. The father of modern design. And I don't think of him as a designer or an architect. I think of him as an artist. He thought that we had a unique lifestyle that was quite different than Europeans. He endorsed the use of machine in the production of design. The really interesting thing was how he began the reduction in simplifying furniture to the sort of very simple geometric elements. This philosophically laid the way for the modern movement of designers, who of course designed for the machine. His furniture and his objects that are just an extension of his architectural genius. He's dealing with an object that needs to uh, create a space, but he's also dealing with an object that can take decoration. By creating open plans and integrating architecture in its surroundings, Frank Lloyd Wright was constantly rethinking the American home and its furnishings, with an emphasis on a single large living space conceived as the heart of the home that served multiple functions of living, dining, entertaining, and conversation, Wright envisioned a reformed and influential way of living. His domestic architecture came to support this type of lifestyle and demonstrated the power of the physical environment to enhance everyday life. And it began with a book, or a small book, that he wrote titled The House Beautiful. And he really saw that the house was an integral tool, essentially, for that. And that what you put in the house the, f the furnishings, the music, the objects were the mechanisms by which you, you helped this goal. Wright's work was the outcome of the American arts and crafts movement, both aesthetically and conceptually. He emphasized simplicity, honesty, and living in harmony with nature. It's not surprising, therefore, that the young Wright found the industrially made commercial furniture available in late Victorian days overly ornate, opulent, poorly constructed, and therefore artificial and inappropriate for his clear, simple, spiritual homes. To instill his interiors with harmony, Wright created furnishings that were free from historical references based on reduced geometrical forms and unornamented. The furniture he designed throughout his career was so architectural and integrated into its interiors that it is often hard to tell when architecture ends and furniture begins. A right was very much like Morris, because Morris, William Morris, when he first uh, graduated from Oxford, he came to London, he couldn't find any piece of furniture that he liked, so he started making his own furniture. And Wright, in a way, was doing something very similar. He didn't like anything that was available. Um, it really didn't match his taste. What was his taste like at that time? Well, when he built his house in 1889, and the studio followed in about four or five years, his taste was actually a bit Victorian. He was looking at the aesthetic movement, uh, and lots of objets d'art arranged in beautiful compositions with plants and textiles. But by the late 1890s, early 1900s, he really began to form what we call his prairie style. How do you characterize the furniture that Frank Lloyd Wright did at the very beginning? I think it was the reduction of furniture to simple geometric forms. That was a major theme going through work in that period. Whether you look at these sort of massive library tables that he would use in living rooms or in dining rooms, where he would do ensembles of these high back chairs, where he was really beginning to use furniture as a way to 
activate his spaces. Frankenstein was very um, against or frustrated with commercial furniture, manufactured furniture. And when you think about this, this is the end of the 19th century, and commercial furniture at that point was mostly designs that came from the past, the revival styles, the basically European styles, and that was what he was trying to break away from. When Frank Lloyd Wright designed furniture, he was thinking to bring harmony to his interiors and create homes that were spiritual. So you live with his furniture. Do you feel that in your home? They do have this quality of standalone art. You know, you start to think of them more as sculpture. Uh, I mean, I live around our dining table are lark and chairs, which were designed in 1904, 1907, and they have that very flat back. And you would think, wow, that looks really uncomfortable. But actually, when you sit in it, it's incredibly comfortable because he figured out just the angle at which you want to lean back. And, you know, I've had hundreds and hundreds of meals at those tables, uh, and it's very comfortable. Uh, when you do see the interior of a, of a complete Frank Lloyd Wright home that still has the furniture in it, yeah, you do feel a kind of connectivity to all of it. Wright's use of uh, the furniture arrangement in a house, uh, his focus on the hearth, it was not terribly different than the rest of the American arts and crafts movement. Um, the difference was really that, art, that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright produced in far fewer numbers. Uh, the pieces were done on commission for specific houses where most of the rest of the movement was production related, uh, at least as it evolved after 1903 or, or 4. Wright's furniture and decorative arts were somewhat ignored during the 60s and 70s when postmodernist scholarship re totally rejected modernist history. An initial interest in his furniture was stimulated by the milestone exhibition called the Arts and Crafts Movement in America, which opened at the Princeton Art Museum in 1972, curated by Robert Clark. It showed furniture, accessories, and windows Wright created in the early phase of his career before leaving his Oak Park studio for Berlin in 1909. The exhibition portrayed Wright as a key contributor to the Chicago branch of the arts and crafts movement for his emphasis on a unity of exterior and interior and on his respect for natural materials and simplicity. Well, I don't think there's any question that Bob Clark's show had a big impact on the field, but I think people have also forgotten a very important show that was done in the Met in 1970 called 19th Century America. And Barry Tracy and Marilyn Johnson ended that show with a big installation of arts and crafts material with Wright, Stickley, Green and Green. And you also have to remember that the Met acquired the Coonley Windows in 1966, which was their first acquisition by Wright. But at the same time, there were people like David Hanks at the Art Institute in Chicago that were collecting Wright and Prairie School designers. So the 70s was very much a preamble to this sort of huge revival of interest in Wright that hit in the 1980s. The catalog was produced and reprinted a number of times. And I think for many people who were curious about design at that point in time, um, they looked to this as really almost a template. I mean, it was an unveiling. And they were seeing these things at thr thrift shops that they were finding. They were finding them at, at house sales. They were finding them at antique markets. And so it very much transformed that museums had developed an interest in the furniture of the period. And they started collecting. Many other books were produced. Obviously, David Hank's book on Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Craig Miller's exhibition in 1984 of Frank Lloyd Wright's material at the Metropolitan Museum. So it really engendered a great deal of interest. This groundbreaking show was followed by a series of exhibitions and publications in the late 70s and early 80s that helped to cement Wright's reputation as a designer. 
with the installation of the famed living room from the Francis Little House at the newly expanded American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1982, his total vision of the interior space and its furnishings became accessible to the public. It was supervised by Craig Miller. The museum bought the house, dismantled all the interiors, but they got the furnishings, done the littles, Japanese prints, architectural drawings, Bosma's portfolios, everything. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great acquisition. But the room was actually installed in 1982, uh, and I was the curator in charge of it. And it was a very interesting moment because it marked a sort of radical new way of installing period rooms at that time. It had natural light, which was unusual. And so the room changes during the day with light and shadow. It's not a static thing. The other thing that's very unusual is that we recreated the exterior facades of the house because the whole idea of spatial flow from inside to outside was such an integral part of Wright's architecture. So it was not the typical sort of painted dioramas that you see in other period rooms in the Met. But it also gave the public a way to sort of walk around the room and see it from many different perspectives. So in all of those ways, it was sort of a radical new way of looking at a period room. In 1977, a key exhibition of Wright's decorative arts opened at the Renwick Gallery in Washington, curated by David Hanks, and marked a seminal moment in the study and awareness of this aspect of Wright's legacy. Upon the death of his third wife in 1985, his collections, his papers, which were previously unavailable to scholars, all of a sudden became accessible to scholars and writers. The retrospective opened at MoMA in 1994, the first critical examination of Wright's architecture, further brought his work to the conscious of a wider public. All of these events would ultimately help shaping the market, which was formed during the 80s at the Department of 20th Century Decorative Arts at Christie's New York, headed by Nancy McClelland. Olga Werner, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's wife, died in 1985. The foundation was held very, very close um, up until that point. Really, it began to loosen within a year or two before with the sale of the papers and the drawings. Uh, some major, major presentation drawings were, were let go from the foundation. Um, and that created a great deal of publicity and it really um, engendered a great deal of interest in drawings in the market. De Lorenzo was among the first dealers to include masterpieces of Frank Lloyd Wright. And wh when did you start? developing an interest in including Frank Lloyd Wright's furniture. The aim of the gallery has always been to uh, offer to be experts of the museum quality pieces of any 20th century decorative arts designer or architect. And it was only obvious that Frank Lloyd Wright had to be included. Where is the market for Frank Lloyd Wright concentrated? Mm -hmm. is, and who are the main players in this market? Yeah, it's a little bit different than a lot of the markets where there is kind of an erratic sensibility to the market. The bespoke furniture that he created is, by nature of how it was made, really limited. It's been a market that's been open for decades, and so a lot of the material has traded hands and has really been absorbed into um, esteemed institutions and incredible collections where it just doesn't trade very often. There aren't dealers really that can say, I focus on Frank Lloyd Wright because there isn't enough material in the way that there is if you're an Italian dealer that focuses on Ponti or you're a French dealer that focuses on Prouvé. You have to say, I'm interested in design and design history and you're, you pursue works or sell works that you have access to. Um, so the work is, it's an international market. I mean, everybody in the world who understands design and architecture knows the name Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, as far afield as Asia, we've sold it in Europe, particularly in France. Uh, we've sold it to Italians, and you know the, the market is most concentrated in, in the United States, which makes sense. I've had collectors from Europe, uh, a few from Spain, also London, and some Asian clients. Frank Lloyd Wright's collectible furniture can be divided into four different categories. 
His early pieces of the Prairie period, which are bold architectural and mostly stained dark, were the first to appear on the market. Over time, as these pieces were absorbed by museum collection and the pioneering private collectors, they gradually became more and more rare. Then the Usonian furniture, which Wright began creating in the 30s for his affordable houses, started attracting the interests of new collectors. The third category includes furniture made for Wright's commercial buildings, particularly for the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, the S.C. Johnson & Son Administration Building in Wisconsin, and for the Price Tower in Oklahoma. Last is the commercially produced furniture which Wright designed in the 50s. So Price Tower is a fascinating commission that he had very late in his career. Price Tower is 1956, so really at the end of his career. So the furniture is part of this complete work of art and it channels that idea of the repeated triangle or the, you know, sometimes they form um, um, different polygons and things like that and trapezoids, but it's really based on the triangle. And all of the furniture then is, is incorporating this motif of the triangle from three to four different types of office chairs and you get um, various desks of different configurations and then you get these really beautiful copper clad over plywood tables and stools which I find really appealing for their patina. They have this really rich green to, to um, copper coloration that they've gotten over time but they're just beautiful sumptuous things. Actually I've collected all categories uh, because I was trying to create a scope for his work, trying to create a general picture of his whole work. The period I pr really, really, really love is the Usonian because he's playing with plywood with very simple material. It's inexpensive, but he is making incredible things with it. We had some very fortunate incidents at the very beginning. The family of Darwin Martin Jr. came forward with the windows, the, t the door size windows, out of the Martin house. And we competed for them and I was absolutely determined that I was going to sell those windows. And when the workmen in the warehouse where they had been held walked across the floor with them, my heart dropped. They were extraordinary. And they were some of the first things that I sold by right. For the prairie houses, which typified the first phase of his career, Wright designed mostly built-in furniture, but some uh, freestanding pieces like tables and chairs. The houses featured a large communal space centered around a fireplace. For the dining area, he designed tall, high back chairs, which meant to provide a sense of enclosure and intimacy in the open space. These chairs have since become the touchstone of Wright's furniture design of this period, along with the barrel chair and the simple architectural tables. Much of the furniture that came out, the very early furniture, was fascinating, but there were specific houses that Wright really um, elaborated um, on when he did them and Darwin Martin was probably a case in point. Many of the pieces came out of the Martin house. Um, oak barrel chairs which were divine um, that we had that were consigned to us. The windows in particular were of interest both the Tree of Life windows of which there were only two um, and then a series of, of windows in the dining room that were also door size, uh, that were a wisteria form. Um, he had become so elaborate, I can't remember how many hundreds of windows are in the house, and the cost would have been enormous because there, the windows were done extraordinarily well with triangular caming or leading, which made them very strong and they could make the lines very thin. Um, but those first two doors that came to market made approximately $100,000 each. And in 1981 and 1982, it was a vast sum of money. The table lamp from the uh, Rabbi House, the famed table lamp, fetched over $700,000 at Christie's in 1988. How did you get to own it? It was one of those pieces that you just bow down to. It's so phenomenal, it's so spectacular. 
And we both knew it, that it was something we wanted for the gallery. And we knew that this lamp had been in the same uh, collection since 1964, and it was in very good condition. So it was a question of how much we wanted to pay for this piece. But Di Lorenzo is a collector. That's what he is first. That's what we are. Um, we, we fall in love with these major pieces. Uh, so he wanted it. But at the time, it was 1980, in the 1980s, and the market was not what it what it is today. We were creating markets. It was the middle of the summer where for dealers is a very slow period. And I had a conversation with him. I said, please, just don't go crazy. He said, I'll try not to. And when he came back, he rang the bell and I saw him through the glass. And he walked in and he said, you have to make a lot of sales because we just bought the, the lamp for $704,000. They had found it in an antique store in Virginia, I believe, and identified it. How, I don't recall. He drove up from Virginia with the lamp and lo and behold, it was the Roby House lamp. Um, and it was fascinating because we had been selling lamps out of the Dana House. The Thomases, who had a, a music publishing business, I think it was music publishing, uh, had the Dana House, had taken it over and used it, used it as offices, but they had kept everything intact. And so they had sold a number of the lamps from the house. So we were very familiar with the lamps and these large lamps that looked like they had a rooftop on them um, and with hanging panels that were very, very Japanesque. The only difference with the Roby House lamp, and we, one had to look very, very carefully at the period photos, uh, was that it had leading in these side panels. And it indeed did have leading in the side panels. And we didn't have provenance to go with it, but I knew the lamps and their construction so well that I had no doubt what it was. Um, and it was very, very exciting. And then obviously having it in the sale and it made an enormous price. Wright's urns are so architectural and beautiful and there are only, I think, about 12 of them out there. Uh, you own three of them? We've owned three of them, yes. Um, there are 12. There is um, five that have the bow tie design and the seven that have the open design. We've owned two with the open design and one with, um, with the bow tie. Uh, they're magical. Is, um, a lot of them are also in museums. And is, if we had the capability of buying more, if there were more available, we would be after them. Some experts say that the bow tie design makes the piece way more valuable than the open design. Do, do you? Wh uh, what's your take on that? Not to us. It has not. We paid very close to the same amount that we paid for the bow tie for the open design. Um, no, what matters to us, of course, is, the, um, is that the piece is in good condition, that there's no major restorations, but that there's only 12, and this is done by Frank Lloyd Wright, so this is what matters to us as dealers and collectors. The dining suite that Wright's design in 1899 for the Husser House in Chicago is a prime example of his vocabulary in this early phase of his career. The nine-piece suite demonstrates geometrical and vertical sensibility and was recently acquired by the Huntington Library after years of being on loan from the Joyce and Irving Wall family. Your parents have collected furniture by Frank Lloyd Wright and they've lived with it. How did this, when did this, they start getting interested in it? There was a moment in the uh, 80s when all things happened to create sort of the perfect storm. There was a lot of material on, uh, material on the market that was coming through the auctions through Nancy McClellan. She was finding great things. Uh, Craig Miller was advising, so you couldn't make a misstep. You were getting the best advice in the world. Uh, my dad was supportive, so you could, you know, go out and buy this material. There was not a lot of competition. I think Max Pilevsky was the only other competition, and he was a good friend. And so 
you know, I think they got interested in Frank, in Frank Lloyd Wright because in that generation, Frank Lloyd Wright was the great architect, as he still is. And in my generation, it was seeing Frank Lloyd Wright as a great artist and, you know, what an opportunity to be able to buy the iconographic uh, examples of his uh, furniture from the 20th century. So it all happened at sort of at once. I more, I more or less led the collecting of the furniture, but my father led the collecting of the drawings. And your parents had, at one point, they owned the uh, Hazard House dining suite. Did, were they living with it? Oh, gosh, many years, maybe 10 or 15 years. Were you having and dinner? They had dinners there. It's an extraordinary dining table because when you sit in this, it's a square table with eight chairs around it that all go up quite high. And so when you sit in the dining table, you're really sitting in this space created by this table. So you feel very empowered. It's an incredibly powerful experience to sit in it. There's not a lot of art in the world that has that kind of power spatially. And so you sat in it and you felt like you were in this sort of spatial beam or this beam of light because you're protected on all sides and you have this upward flowing feeling. And it, it was. So it sounds like a beautiful. strong experience. It's a very physical with his experience. Furniture, using his furniture. Yeah, you know, the great thing about living with it is you're living with great masterpieces, but they're not constantly banging you over the head, telling you how great they are, because they're function. They really function. They really function as furniture. A chair is comfortable. A desk is at the right height. A table is beautiful. You know, so they become like friends. It's not just like you're living with a Frank Lloyd Wright, this or that. It's like they become a part of your life because they give back to you. For the moderately priced homes that he started designing during the Depression and continue designing after the war, Wright designed a totally different types of furniture with a new vocabulary. Called Usonia, named after the United States of North America, these homes represent Wright's vision and contribution to the culture of homes for middle-class American. His Usonian ideal enabled families with limited means to migrate to the countryside to experience the organic, relaxed lifestyle that he envisioned and to live in a custom house. Intended to be for average people, modest people, and that idea hadn't really taken off yet. But with World War II, things changed radically. Uh, Americans were really trying to go forward. They didn't want to look back. They didn't want to, to continue that, that past, which had been really difficult. And Wright would say, well, I've been here for 40 years. This is the message I've been giving that design for the average person is really important to me. You first created the uh, collection of Frank Lloyd Wright's decorative arts at the Met. Did you include your Sonian furniture in that collection? Very much so, because the idea of the collection was that it would really be an overview of Wright's career from the 1890s right up to the 50s. When he began to do the Usonian houses, he began to develop a whole new line of furniture, concept for furniture. He began to use plywood, uh, sheets of material versus sticks or slabs of wood. It demanded a new way of construction and also the furniture began to reflect the complex geometries that Wright was playing with in the Usonian houses in that period. So it was really essential to have that work from the 30s and 40s represented in the collection. Because the market at that time was not developed specifically not for Usonian furniture. Well, I was actually where very. Did you find, where did you find the pieces? I was very lucky. I got pieces given from Old Brass Plantation, which was a project that Wright did in South Carolina. So I had my pick of all the furniture from that house for the museum. The market for Usonian furniture mm -hmm. has just established, I believe, in the past few years, right. in recent years. Yeah. What can you tell us about the market and who are the collectors interested yeah. in that particular type of furniture? Usonian is really interesting to me because it represents a different category of collectors that is a departure from the early prairie school collectors that really established the market for Frank Lloyd Wright's furniture and decorative arts. So 
Um, it's a younger collector that's pursuing Usonian furniture. It shows this real inventiveness of form and of, of sculptural characteristics that give it this kind of contemporary flavor. It fits well into the design collections of a younger generation. How much of the Usonian furniture that you offer to write comes directly mm -hmm. from the original houses, meaning yeah. primary market? Correct. And how much is secondary market? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, very little comes out of the original homes anymore. This was a phenomenon that was more prevalent uh, a few decades ago. Um, we did have the privilege of selling a few pieces from the Kenneth Laurent house that was designed in 49 and built by 51. Um, the Kenneth Laurent, the original owner, um, still lived in the house life. and he was trying to sell his house um, for a long time and he couldn't find any buyers so he really needed a bridge loan but didn't want to gut the house so we did sell uh, a few pieces of furniture from him but by and large the furniture comes from the secondary market. The Usonian homes were no less sophisticated than Wright's early homes and were also defined by his meticulous attention to every detail. Characterized by sharp geometrical shapes and a rational modular system, Usonian furniture is often referred to as origami for its resemblance to folded paper. The absurd forms consistent with the interior and many of the freestanding furniture pieces were economical, humble, semi-custom. They were constructed from inexpensive woods and plywood often by cabinet makers on the building sites. General Frank Lloyd Wright created the Usonian furniture out of inexpensive woods right. because it was all about um, homes for middle class America. Yes. A, or even plywood. Correct. Plywood or inexpensive wood. Yes. So what is the condition, general condition of this mm -hmm. furniture today? Yeah. It's had various conditions. Um, a lot of it has had restoration over the years. The, you don't have this sophisticated joinery. Typically, it's just there's a simple blocking underneath the seat that connects the, uh, the sides to the seat and, and so on. And so you do find that this material starts to loosen over time. And we found pieces where you have nails driven into the side, through the plywood sides, into the seat to, to hold it. Um, but it's just like anything, furniture lives a life, it has a certain function and it's used over time and it necessitates some restoration. Uh, we try to keep it intact, we try to keep the most original surfaces possible. And by and large what I've seen is very little refinishing and repair to be honest. It is made from simple furniture and you might have, or from simple materials, and you might have um, losses to the veneer where the plywood rests directly on the floor. There aren't any, typically any metal feet or any sort of um, uh, material there or even any solid wood where the plywood meets the floor. The pieces Wright designed for his commercial buildings were recognized for their forward thinking from the time the market was first emerged in the 80s. The Imperial Hotel in Tokyo completed in 1922, one of Wright's most remarkable achievements, conveyed his interest and love for Japanese art. The piece most associated with this building is the hexagonal back chair, which echoed the ceiling and other architectural elements of the famed building, which was demolished in 1968. Legend has it that there was an original set of furniture done with caning, and you see that in the photographs where caning appears in the back panels, the seats, and in the side panels. And there were sort of loose cushions that were there for a bit of comfort. But MacArthur supposedly had the American headquarters in the Imperial Hotel after World War II. And when the hotel reopened, they made new furniture. And this is what is thought to be the upholstered pieces. Um, it's very rare that you see pieces with the caning. The Met does have one chair where the side panels were caned, and we had those reproduced to put back in there. But most of the time, it's the upholstered pad in the sort of yellow naga hide that you see on the chairs when they appear on the market. So, so do you think collectors should really look for canning, or is that really does it make any difference in terms of collecting today? Sure, because it's furniture from the 1920s versus furniture from the post-World War II period. So it would be an earlier version of it. 
but it's very rare that you see a chair that's you know that could have survived for 90 years with this original caning uh, without you know being damaged. The S.C. Johnson and Son Administration building was completed in 1939. Wright designed furniture in enameled steel and walnut for its distinctive windowless working place defined by giant piers which expand into large circular tops that form much of the ceiling. The brick-colored desks and chairs designed in curves and circles to reflect the architecture are still in use at the offices of the company. With the permission from the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, they're produced by Casina from 1992 until 2012 in a limited edition of 350 pieces each. While S.C. Johnson's policy forbids selling or gifting the furniture, the one exception was a desk and a chair famously sold by Chrissy's in 1985, now in the collection of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. The S.C. Johnson desk and chair were extraordinary. Um, we, a consigner brought them to us who had bought them, I believe, at a charity auction at the Cooper Hewitt Museum. Um, little did we realize at the time when we took them in that that would be the only desk uh, that would come to market. And to this moment, uh, we've not seen another. The S.C. Johnson Company has certainly loaned a number of these desks to various museums. I assume that they must have donated this one to the charity auction at the Cooper Hewitt. We certainly had no problems at the time. Um, but. What is curious is you have seen many chairs uh, come to market. I shouldn't say many, but you've seen a number of the chairs that were made for that desk that have come out, but there have been no more desks. In 1955, when Wright designed his first commercially produced furniture for Heritage Henry Don, he was 86 years old. In the same year, he also designed a group of textiles and wallpapers for F. Schumacher and Company under the brand name Taliesin Assemble. Although the furniture line was priced to be accessible to the average consumer, it was not a commercial success and was taken out of the production after less than two years. Neither the prestigious name of Freight nor the slogan Furniture for the Housewife, as it was promoted during the golden age of Mad Men, helped to turn the line into a success. Aesthetically, all pieces were loosely inspired by Wright's early furniture, though they were decorated with ornamental moldings. Furniture Frank Lord Wright did for Hanverdon. It was a factory, it was the first and the only uh, commercial line of furniture that he had done. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had done 63 models right. of furniture. Mm -hmm. Do you know, do you have any idea how much was produced at the time? It was only produced within two years, 1955 Correct. to 1956. Yes. The actual numbers I've never come across, so I don't know that fact. I don't believe it was um, a very large production. The material was expensive to produce and it was a limited market. And when I look at it from an ob observational standpoint in the marketplace, you know, from my vantage point now, you know, 50, 60 years on, very little of it has actually traded in the market. So I feel like there was very little of it made. I don't know the specific numbers. So the Hanradon furniture can be found in museum collections, right? Right at the Met and other museums. Yeah. Is there any? Is, but there is no really market for it. How, how do right. you explain that? Well, something that is in an, in a museum doesn't necessarily have to have tremendous value. I mean, museums are known for collecting ephemera or the papers of an architect or you know, drawings by designers that really when you try to monetize those things in the marketplace, you, you struggle with it. So it's not necessarily the value that, that makes it relevant to, a, to an institution's collection. But from an institutional standpoint, it represents the spectrum of what Frank Lloyd Wright designed. Do you think the value for this furniture, does it have any room to increase? I do. Um, I actually have been buying some of it myself for my own collection and I like how it mixes in. And I feel that there is this resurgence in interest in Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, this the historical connection of Frank Lloyd Wright to the world of architecture and design is huge. 
and I think people do want a part of that. More than any other American architect, Wright embodied the concept of the architect's responsibility for every detail of the domestic living. In his mind, the home contains spiritual and moral values and should manifest as a total and integrated work of art where every piece of furniture, lighting, art glass, rug created a harmonious unity and was a meaningful part of the integral scheme. Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, orchestrated the home like a symphony.